This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Welcome back, everybody, for the first episode of 2017. As usual, I'm Dan Stevenson, and this week I'm not joined by Matt DeBorg as usual. I have a special guest co-host. I have Mike Gold with me. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing just fine, Dan. Thank you. Mike, why don't you uh, why don't you tell people about yourself? Well, I'm yeah, I'm Mike. I'm a student living in Calgary, and I uh, big fan of the Flames. I go to about six seven games a year uh, a lot fewer than matt does but uh i tried do my best to watch every single game and i'm a big fan of the team and i'm glad to be joining uh dan here on this podcast today mike helps us out here at fireside chat doing all the recaps of the flames home games if you've read any of our recaps you've probably seen mike and he's active online on social media he runs his own blog but a uh, knowledgeable flames fan to step in for matt this week so Mike, why don't we jump right into the games? We'll be looking mostly at last week, which was the final week of 2016. Isn't that yeah. weird to think that we're in 2017 already? It sure is. I mean, it uh, seems like just yesterday that we were counting down to 2016. So the Flames played four games since we were on last. Uh, they played Vancouver, Colorado, Anaheim, and Arizona. I finally got that right. I said Arizona, not Phoenix. We'll <laughs> see if that lasts for the rest of the show. I think the best way to probably sum up the game against the Canucks was domination. It just seemed like the Canucks weren't ready in this one. If I look back at the game, the Canucks didn't seem like they were ready. They just seemed like they didn't come to play, and Calgary took advantage of it. Um, Brian Elliott only faced 14 shots, which tells you that the team is not ready to play. And I think it was a good way for the Flames to really build their spirits going into this lull. We always see that week between Christmas and New Year's, the teams don't always play well. They're probably thinking about Christmas. They're thinking about their family. And I think it was a good way to build some momentum for that week. What were your thoughts on this game? Oh, for sure. And, I mean, you look at what Brian Elliott did in this game. He had that weird goal go in on him uh, in the first period. Uh, Nikita Tramkin shoots that puck from the point, and it bounces over his head and into the net. And that could have shattered his confidence. Uh, but then the Flames come back with a really good second period. Mark Giordano leads the team to two straight goals. Uh, and then, I mean... What was sort of a uh, sort of foreshadowing the rest of the week was Michael Backlund with three points in this game, and so those were three key po- performances by uh, those players, which I really think helped elevate the Flames to this victory. The Canucks were really, really poor in this game. They had very little attack. They re- very they didn't resemble the team that uh, played the Flames in the 2014-15 playoffs at all. I mean, they were vastly outmatched by the Flames. Yeah, I think this is a very different team than the 2014-2015 playoffs, though. I mean, the Canucks are kind of trying to do an in-built, an in-place rebuild. They're not, I don't think, willing to say we're ripping this thing apart and redoing it like most teams do, but it's obvious that they're trying to rebuild this, and I think there's a transition year for them. Mm-hmm, for sure, and it really, uh, there's a lot of parallels between uh, this Canucks team and the uh, Flames team of the early 2010s uh reluctance to uh rebuild trade away their aging veterans i mean there will be some dark years ahead for the canucks for sure i'm i'm just glad in this game that we kept uh granlin and we kept berchi off the score sheets yeah because you always hate to see those former flames score on the team oh they always seem to burn us don't they there's some players that just always do well against the flames so I don't know about you. I don't have much else to say in this one besides I think the Flames really dominated Vancouver and I think surprised Vancouver with the tempo that they played. Mm-hmm, for sure. They were definitely the better team. Looking at the next game of the week, the Calgary Flames played the Colorado Avalanche. This is a mm-hmm. team that's yeah. been struggling. Yeah. Um, and an, another team with some former Flames. We all know that Aginla's on this team and some people might remember that Joe Colborn's playing for this team now. Rene Bork too. Oh, that's right. Renny Bork, he's jumping around the league all the time. Sure is. I, I, he's one of their leaders in goals scored this season, which is pretty indicative of how the Avalanche are doing. Yeah. This was, I don't know, I think this was a, a weird game. The Flames were, the Flames came out looking like a grinding team. Um, but again, they I think they overpowered the Avalanche here. The Avalanche were lucky, in my opinion, to get three goals. I didn't like that Iggy got one. 
Um, but I just thought that for most of the night, the Flames played the better game. They played a more complete game. The Avalanche just kind of looked like they were running around the ice, not really sure what to do a lot of po- points here. Yeah. And the Flames seemed like after the Vancouver game, they came out and they knew what they had to do to, to try and get the win. Yeah, I mean, the Avalanche looked like a team in that game that didn't really know a lot about playing good hockey, and it's showing in their standings. They were out of position a lot of, a lot of time in the game, and I think that resulted in the four goals bouncing off of them and into the net. I mean, you look at the Flames' second period, another three-point night for Backlund, and all four of the goals they scored in that period either deflected off of an Avalanche player or, well, not either. They just did go off an avalanche player, and they went straight into the net. And that was a result of just poor overall positioning and poor play by Colorado. I think they were outclassed in this game for sure. Um, and, yeah, seeing again like get on the board was a little bittersweet, but, I mean, that's got to happen sometime, right? You know what? I'm still an Aginla fan. I mean, Matt and I have talked about if he should come back here or not, but either way, he's a good player, and it's good to see him getting some goals. Oh, for sure. I mean, boosting that trade value, I guess, for Colorado. But, yeah, it was a little bittersweet seeing him with only eight points coming into that game. Yeah. Um, anything else about that one you want to chat about? Uh, um, I think that was another Brian Elliott game. I thought it was a solid performance from him. I mean, Elliott should be getting the majority of the starts. If you look, he's the proven starting goalie. We've seen a flash in the pan from Johnson, but I'm glad to see us seeing Elliott kind of getting his legs under him again. He didn't look that great at the beginning of the year. He lost the net to Johnson, and I think that he's really working hard to reclaim that net. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And, I mean, you look at a guy like Brian Elliott who fought for years to get out of St. Louis. Uh, Well, I mean, he was in that endless tandems with guys like Halak and Ryan Miller and Jake Allen. And this was a guy with great stats, and you thought he could maybe lead a team one day. And then when he finally gets that chance, well, he loses his crease to uh, to Chad Johnson. So I think it's it's been really nice seeing him getting some good starts, stringing them together over the last few days, you know. And, uh, yeah, he was great. He was great this past week. And the next game of the week was actually not a Brian Elliott game. Chad Johnson went back in the net as we took on the Anaheim Ducks, thankfully in Calgary, because that means we had a chance to win this one. Um, But, I mean, anytime you face the Ducks, you're up for a challenge. They're a mature veteran team. They have several lengthy runs in the playoffs. There's a team that knows how to win a hockey game and knows how to play well together. And I think with the Flames going into this game with Dougie Hamilton out due to injury, we were already at a disadvantage because we lost one of our key pieces to this game. And really, I think if you if you look at this game, it was really just a, the Flames, as we often see when they play the Ducks, their inability to adapt to the Ducks game. This was the Flames, I think, playing Flames hockey. And this really shows where we are in the NHL. It shows that, you know, the Flames are uh, are not a good are not one of the top teams, let's put it that way, because when we play a team like the Ducks, we just we often can't compete. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, I had the opportunity to go to this game in person, and uh, yeah, the Flames came out early. Uh, Backlund again scored that great goal in the first period, but then after that, John Gibson really, I, th- I think he really stood on his head for the Ducks, and they really uh, had a great attack um, after that. Um, I, the Flames gave up two power play goals in this game, uh, which has not been a trend for them uh, as of late, but in this game it was, and uh, the Ducks were quite physical in this game, and also, yeah, they were missing Dougie Hamilton, uh, which who, who has been a big catalyst on the power play over the last few weeks. Um, and, he, yeah. and, as I, and, you know, you're mentioning the power play goals that they gave up. If you look at this game, and I've said this since the beginning of the year, the Flames took more penalty minutes than the opposition and lost. And that seems to be the trend. Anytime we're heavily penalized, we're losing. If you look at the Vancouver game, we took four minutes to Vancouver's eight in the box. If you look at the Avalanche, we took 12 minutes to their 16. Like It seems like the trend is if we take less penalty minutes than our opponents, we win. If we take more, we lose. And this was another case where we were penalized more. We put a good team like the Ducks with a man advantage for four more minutes, and they capitalized on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I said to the guys who I was at the game with that because Hamilton was out, that opened the door for Watherspoon to step in the lineup. And uh, he created a pairing with Yerky Yokopaka. Um, That was an adventurous pairing, uh, to say the least, in that game. They uh, were on the ice for some questionable chances against, and 
I think just having Hamilton in the lineup really solidifies that the the six de- uh, the uh, group of six defensemen who are on the ice, and I I don't think. What I've seen from Wotherspoon this season really hasn't been encouraging for me uh, to suggest a long-term NHL career. Well, I think that, you know, uh, and if you look at Wotherspoon, he's been recalled so many times and not been played. I honestly think the organization lost faith in this guy and they threw him in because they needed him last minute. Um, but I, I really don't see, if you look at the depth on our defensive depth chart, I don't see Wotherspoon having a, a career as a flame or even as a, you know, a Stockton Heat player for much longer. I think this will be his last year here. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I think the Flames, I think they'll lose Wotherspoon, they'll lose Wyman, they might even lose England after this season. You know, and I mean, a guy like Wotherspoon, if you are, and I hate to go back to this all the time, but if you're the Vegas team and you have to fill two rosters, you've got to essentially put an NHL roster and an AHL roster out there. A guy like Wotherspoon might not be bad to pick up as a free agent for a year just to help you build out some AHL depth. True. Yeah, you see uh, you see NHL teams already established doing that all the time. So, yeah, I'm sure Vegas might take a look at this guy. You know, and you were mentioning um, that Wotherspoon stepped into the lineup. A player that we saw out of the lineup with an injury who we've seen out for the first time was Troy Brower. And did you, we'll talk more about what this is going to mean for the Flames going forward, but did you feel that Brower being out of the lineup was as impactful as Hamilton being out of the lineup? No, um, I, I didn't, uh, to, be, to be blunt. Um, I think Brower, Brower is a fine player, and I think he's a good leader in the, uh, in the uh, dressing room, but he's not always the most impactful player on the ice. And when you're paying $4.5 million for a guy like that, you want him to be a pretty impactful player. But I saw Garnet Hathaway playing in that Anaheim game, and physically he brought more to the table than Brower. And and the next game, uh, he it looked like he might have scored a goal. I mean, Brower doesn't do that too often. I mean, when you're paid four point five million dollars a season, I think we should be expecting more of a top six guy. But what I've seen from Brower this year is a guy I think who's more suited to the third line. I don't know what you think, but. Uh, you know, I mean, we're seeing some Flames who've had some struggles. We're seeing a guy like Brower struggle. I'd say that Elliott's been struggling this year. Monaghan's been struggling this year. So we have some players that are struggling. And we also have some players on the other side. I'd say guys like Froelich who have elevated themselves for the first time. I think that for Brower, he's never really been looked at as a top winger. And I think maybe there's some pressure on him. Um He's not playing on the first line, but we all expected that's where he might slot in there. But yeah, he's he's just he's not playing the way that we'd expect him to. Now it's a long contract, so you really hope that you know by the end of the contract it's worth the money. But for a four-year, eighteen million dollar deal, this is one of the few veterans, unfortunately, that I think we I don't want to say we'll be better without, but I think that the Flames aren't going to miss all that much in the lineup. I mean. Five on five, he's looking mediocre. Some nights you don't even see him. Um, he he hasn't played a lot of special teams play. So, you know, like he's, I thought he's looked bad when he has been on the power play. But yeah, it's too bad. I just don't think this team's going to miss Brower all that much. No, to be totally honest, if Chris Versteeg was on Troy Brower's contract, I would be a little bit more, uh, more satisfied with the team. Well, I don't know. Versteeg's been made of glass this year. I know, I know. If I, th- I think if Chris Versteeg was not so injury prone as he is, he would be a first line forward in the NHL. But as as it stands, he gets injured every other month. It seems. But I, I, I do hope the Flames can find a way to keep him in the lineup going forward because I feel he brings a lot to the team with his playmaking playmaking abilities more than Brower. I think. But uh, it's hard to be as effective when you're out of the lineup so much. Yeah, and, you know, I think the the upside of this is, yeah, we're going to miss Troy Brower, and I don't know him personally. I don't know what he's like as a leader in the lineup or in the locker room or anything like that. You have to imagine as a veteran, that's one of the things he's looked at uh, for support on. But I think this allows younger players to step in, and you talked about Hathaway filling some of that role. I think Hathaway provides some grit there. I don't think Hathaway's ever going to be the offensive, have the offensive upside of a Troy Brower. No. Um, but you know, if you look at Johnny Goudreau, he got hurt earlier this season. He came back and he's been on fire since. Yep. So maybe Troy Brower just needs to sit out for a little bit. And hopefully when he comes back, we'll see a different Troy Brower. But based on what we're seeing right now, um, 
you know, I think that his role could he I think Michael Furlan could step into his role in the lineup. Furley's been looking good lately. I don't think he's as offensively sound, but I think he's better offensively than um than Hathaway is. Mm-hmm. Yep, and I think sure. it's gonna it's gonna let some other guys show off what they've got. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But you know, and I mean it's not like it's not like we've lost our best player. I would say that no, no. I mean if you look at Brower so far this year, I think that even if the Flames didn't sign him we could have got along this year without that player in the lineup. I, I agree. Um, I think the Flames, they rolled a Versteeg monahan Brower line a lot before Brower got injured, and I think a Versteeg monahan Furland line could have achieved much of the same. Um, but, I mean, he's here. Uh, and, and it's a long contract, and I mean, if you look at Brower, he's generally not this bad, right? It's like Elliot's. So I think we need to give them some time to to come around and to get adjusted to a new system and a new coach. And hopefully, you know, by the end of this, if you and I talk in three years, we're going to have a very different outlook on Brower. Hopefully I hope this isn't, you know, the next Weidman contract. Yeah, for sure. Because I think Brower uh, is really liked by his teammates. I mean, he's an assistant captain. Um, and I mean, yeah, I wish him well uh, as a flame, but right now the returns have not been 100%. Uh, uh, encouraging do you see because of this do you see the flames making any call up well browers out um well i think i think they're uh well suited right now um in terms of players but uh personally i'd like to see maybe the next con uh call up be andrew Mangiapani. uh i feel like there's a lot of fans who are really excited for this guy there's some fans who might not know who he is what he brings but Mangiapani's a pretty small guy um just sort of like in the mold of uh, Goudreau, but uh, he's really crafty with the puck, really skilled, and uh, I think he can really uh, develop into a uh, really good player. He's 20 years old. He played for the Barry Colts in junior, and he was a star there. I believe he was top three in the OHL in scoring a couple of years, uh, and uh, he's ripping it up in Stockton right now, so I'd be really excited to see him. And usually a guy ripping it up in Stockton, it's a good reason to bring them to the NHL team and give them a look. Um, but, you know, I don't think if you look at the roster the way it is, I don't think there's a need to call somebody up unless we get another injury here. No, for sure, no. Um, I uh, I think the Flames are, are well suited for what, for what they're doing right now in terms of personnel. And, I mean, if they were going to make a call up because Brower's a right winger, I could see them uh, get – Perhaps bringing up Poirier to see what they've got there because he plays yep. on the same side. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, they want to see what they still have with Poirier. I mean, they traded uh, – was it a Ginla f- for Poirier? Uh, he was part of that deal, I believe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So No, Klimchuk was part of that deal. We're, we're both of the, uh, uh, mm, I'd right. have to check. I think uh, – po- no, Poirier was acquired in the Bowmeister trade. That, I think so, yeah. Correctly. And uh, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big asset to have traded for him. So, uh, so that yeah, they might want to see what they still got in this guy. Looking at the last game of the week before we move on, then the Flames were without Troy Brower for the second game when they took on a pretty terrible uh, Arizona Coyotes team. This is yeah. a, I mean, look at the, it's so weird. Look at the Coyotes last year; they weren't expected to do anything, and they were pretty good. They come out this year, and they're playing about where they should be. They're second last in the West. And again, the story, as it always has been, the Flames took half the penalties that the Coyotes did. They had 20 penalty minutes, the Flames 10, and we ended up with a 4-2 win here. I don't know if there's really much to say, but I think like a lot of games um, this week, the Flames really overpowered the Coyotes. But I think you saw the Flames playing a little bit differently here. I, to me, I was seeing the Flames trying to... I don't want to say play more experimentally, but it almost looked like they were trying some new things while they were out there, knowing this might be a team they could get away with some of that. Mm -hmm. Well, they shot out to a really hot start in the first period. They did. Scoring two power play goals, something they had allowed two power play goals in the last game, so them to come back and score two was nice to see. Um, Yeah, four goals in the first period from some from some peculiar names, uh, Lance Boma with his second of the year, and then I think they really eased up uh, after that, um, giving up two goals in the uh, second and third periods. I mean, their second period was quite poor, uh, quite, quite poor. They gave up 16 shots to the Coyotes um, and only got six of their own. Uh, they came back for a nice rebound period in the third, but they still let in a goal 
overall, if I was Glenn Gullitz, and I'd be happy with the with the effort I saw from the Flames in the first and last periods, but ooh, they were uh, outmatched in the second period for sure. Yeah, but I mean, you know, and we've seen this often with the Flames where they'll come out in the first, they'll play well, they'll come out in the second, they get outmatched, and then in the third, it's hard to get it back. And I have to give the Flames props in this one for, I think, coming into the third and saying, okay, we have to get this game back yeah. and going ahead, getting it back and getting the win there. We didn't just kind of fall apart like we often see with this team of, oh, well, they've come back, they've put some pressure on us, let's just go home now. Yeah, for sure. They did a really good job in holding on for the win here. And an interesting note in this one, Michael Froelich was on the uh, power play. He was in the second power play unit, and mm -hmm. he snapped a 20-game goalless drought. Yeah, that's insane, Michael so Froelich. That's Froelich's seventh of the of the year, and he also got an assist on Michael Backlund's power play goal. Indeed. So of our four goals, two of them were with the man advantage, and you know that's what we're what, what, what I was talking about earlier. You know, we we give ourselves. We had 10 minutes with the with the man advantage here that the Coyotes didn't have, and it helped us out. Well, I remember... I, oh, sorry. And the other one that was good to see is Dennis Weidman getting a goal. Yes, he got the second sure. goal of the night from Brody and Versteeg as third. I think that Weidman has... I mean, all eyes are on Weidman this year, and I think that it's nice to see Weidman putting some offensive numbers up if for no other reason than it's going to help his trade value. Oh, for sure. It was quite the shot he took. It went through three pairs of legs on the... En route to sailing past the goalie, but uh, but yeah, um, yeah, it was it was quite the effort from the Flames in the first period. Uh, I remember back in early December, or maybe it was late uh, late November. Uh, NHL.com released their uh, projections for the All Star Game, who'd get named, and Michael Frolik was uh, the Flames. Uh, they projected that Frolik would get sent to the All Star Game from the Flames because he led the team with 15 points. And I remember three weeks later going back to the Flames stats and looking at the uh, stats, and Froelich still had 15 points. So he sort of disappeared there for a while. So it's it's nice to see him heating back up. I think he, I think he's had a really good season with, played with, paired with that. Yeah, and I think Froelich's had to adjust his game a bit. I mean, I think he's finally – this is a guy, again, like we were talking about with Brower earlier, that when he was signed, a lot of people thought, oh, this is a bad signing. He's overpaid, you know. There's this is not going to be a good sign. And I think that if we think that Froelich is an offensive, you know, an offensive titan, he's not. You're going to be wrong there. But I think that if you look at him as sort of a two way forward, a guy who can put the puck in the net, but also who, as we've seen with Backlund, they can play a good transitional game. They can play a shutdown game. I think he brings a lot of things to this team that aren't necessarily putting the puck in the net. But you know what? He's got 21 points in the year right now, seven goals, 14 assists. And the only guys who have more are Goudreau, Backlund, Kachuk, and Hamilton. Yep. Froelich's been very impressive to me this season at both ends of the ice all, all year. And even, even last year, um, I didn't think he was as bad as many people thought. Um, I mean, he's always been pretty good with Backlund, and I think last year, uh, I don't know if Hartley completely realized that. He wasn't with uh, Backlund all the time. And this year, I think uh, the coaching staff has really embraced uh, his role as a two-way forward who's really solid at both ends of the ice, and it's great to see him uh, doing as well as he is. And I think we may see Froelich pick up a bit on the offensive side with Brower out, and I think we're going to be looking for somebody to contribute a little bit more offensively there. For sure, yeah. Well, with that, um, unless there's anything else you want to chat about for the week, the Flames are now sitting at 7th in the West with 42 points, which does put them at this point in playoff contention if the end of the season was today. And, you know, I mean, this is a team that struggled for a lot of the year. We were near the bottom, and to be 7th, um, it's funny how the mighty have fallen. Edmonton's only three points above us right now. I think they're going to continue to plummet. But, you know, this team... I don't want to say they're going to be a playoff team, but you know they they've they're putting up good numbers now. And the only bad thing about putting up good numbers, if you miss the playoffs, you get a mediocre draft pick with nothing to show for it. So, but you know we we want to get up there. And if you look, we're at forty two points. Um, Edmonton, St. Louis are tied for forty five. Anaheim has forty six. It's feasible that in the next couple of weeks the Flames could probably jump as high as fourth in the West. I wouldn't be surprised. And. I know as a Flames fan who was alive in the early 2010s how frustrating it is to have mediocre draft picks while still missing the playoffs. I, there was a stretch of th uh, three years there where I believe they finished 10th, 10th, and 9th in the West, which uh, 
led to some very interesting draft choices. Um, who Don't talk to me about bad draft choices in the 2010s. You exactly. weren't around for the Rico Fata, the Daniel Kachuk, <laughs> all those picks. Oh, I saw the John Negrins and the Matt Pelliches and those guys all flame out, flame out once they uh, reach the NHL. Uh, but but I think um, I think the Flames have done a good job in recent years, either do, doing really poorly in the standings or making the playoffs. So no complaints there. So we were talking a bit earlier about some of the guys in this team, um, you know, guys like Hamilton who've really come around and, you know, become an anchor on the blue line. We talked about Brower and some of his disappointing results. A couple other players that you and I have talked about this week who – I thought we could have a bit of a conversation with the first one being Sam Bennett. Sam Bennett was a highly touted draft pick. This was a guy who, if you look back, he had an outside chance of going first overall in his draft year. I remember going and watching that draft of Flames Central with Matt, and we were excited that Sam Bennett was still on the board when the Flames came to pick at sixth. This is a player who, he seemed to have some growth in his rookie year. To me, he hasn't grown a lot since that rookie year. Um, I think we've kind of seen him stagnate a bit, not unheard of, you know, and not necessarily a bad thing. Look around the league and you'll see other guys who've done the same thing. I look at a guy like Kyle Turris, who I think got rushed to the show and I don't think really turned it on to his about 24, 25. To me, I think Bennett got rushed to the show a little bit. I would have probably kept him in junior another year, but that's why I'm not the GM of this team. Um, but let me ask you, Mike, do you think that Bennett is progressing the way you'd like? Well, um, I sure hope we don't trade him for David Runblad like, uh, like happened with Turris. But uh, Sam Bennett is a curious case. Um, he's shown a lot of really good flashes over his two uh, full, NH- full NHL seasons, um, most notably a game early uh, last January against the Florida Panthers where he scored four goals. I'm sure many of you remember that. Um, but Bennett has been a curious player to watch this year. I mean, he's been shifted around a bunch of lines. He's played with Gaudreau. He's played with a whole bunch of different wingers. and it, he, he sort of reminds me of Froelich from last year. Uh, he can't really get a good mojo going because he's been with so many guys and he can't really establish reliable chemistry with any of them. I'm not worried about Bennett, though. Um, I'm, I'm still uh, confident that he'll turn into a really, really good NHL player. Um, I mean, what from what he's shown over his first 100 or so games in the NHL is that he, he's maybe a bit more uh, one-dimensional than we thought, but he's still pretty good physically, and he's I, I feel he's pretty good away from the puck. He, uh, but but I'm, I'm not sure about his possession stats. Uh, do you know how he's doing in terms of that? Uh, I don't have possession stats uh, in front of me. I could look them up, but um, as you were mentioning, he's played 170, 117 games so far. Overall, he has 27 goals, 20 assists for 55 total NHL points. And you were mentioning one-dimensional, and that really reminded me of another Flames first-round pick, which was Mm -hmm. Michael Backlund. I think for a lot of people, Backlund, for a few years there, looked like he was a bust. I was seeing that from Flames fans. This guy's a bust. He's no good. And I think Backlund, he's not the offensive muscle that a Goudreau or Monaghan is, but I think Backlund has cemented himself well as a bottom six, more of a defensive forward. And I think he's going to be with the Flames for a long time in that role. And to me... I think that Bennett might be the same. He might not have the same offensive or at least the same scoring touch he did in the OHL, but I think this might be one of the Flames' better setup guys going forward. Yeah. So, look, yeah, I'm I'm really happy with uh with Michael Backlund as a Flame. Uh, I I think they should be extending him as soon as he can be. Uh, he's he's impressed in every way this year. Um, but then you look at a guy like Bennett. Um. And his his stats this year, and sorry if this uh, if this alienates some of our viewers, but his stats this year are uh, listeners. I mean, not viewers. His stats this year are on the lower side. His uh, his Corsi four percentage is forty seven point four percent. And for those of you who don't know, that means that when he's on the ice, uh, the majority of the shots are coming against the Flames. However, uh, that being said, his PDO, uh, which is a measurement of a player's luck, is ninety eight. Um, and a PDO under 100 is typically indicates that you're unlucky. And so I think with Bennett, as he progresses, he'll get a lot better. Uh, he'll be more consistent. I think that's another one of his issues is that he might not be as consistent as we, he, we'd like. I mean, he's not running a Bork, but he's, uh, there's a lot of offensive potential there. And I, I, I don't think we should be even looking at like getting rid of him. But 
um, th there's a there's a good future for Bennett. I'm sure of it, and I'm sure that it'll be in this organization. Sure. And you were mentioning his numbers. Last year, he played 77 games. He had 18 goals and 18 assists for 34 or 36 total points. This year, he's played 39 games, nine goals, nine assists for 18 points. So that's about if the same. I, if I run the math, he's on point to do pretty much the same production. And mm -hmm. really, I mean, from a guy who's a second, third liner, if he's hitting about 40 points a year, that's still good offensive production there. Mm -hmm. Um, to me, the biggest thing that we need to figure out with him is the stupid penalties. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sam Bennett takes too many stupid penalties and too many penalties that cost the Flames goals, and in some cases that go on to cost the Flames the game. And I think the biggest thing with this guy that we need to worry about is, you know, how do we keep him out? Because every time there's a penalty at a key scenario or a key time in the game, it seems to be from Bennett. And I think the coaching staff just to work on that a little bit with him mentally of – staying out of the box a stat about bennett that really shocked me uh when i came across it is that last season he had 37 penalty minutes in 77 games this year he has 39 penalty minutes in 39 games so you see what's happening there and i, I well, i'd say he's taking almost a minute a game yeah i mean like that's what on pace for a minor penalty every two games yeah and that's too many from a guy like bennett who should be i mean we should be relying on a guy like bennett to be this probably a bad comparison, but our Joe Sackick, our uh, our Evgeny Malk, and our good second line center who's playing behind our guy like Monahan. I find but, it interesting that you call Sackick a second line center. Well, well, yeah. Uh, Sackick well, was they, the cornerstone of that Colorado too, team for a long time. Too, come on. Uh, uh, no, yeah, that was that was poor. But but regardless, we should be relying on Bennett to be an offensive catalyst who's pretty similar to Monahan, you know, and. But what I've seen with Bennett this year is a guy who's pretty feisty, but I feel like his aggression sometimes sometimes gets too much of him, and uh, it's leading to, leading to too many penalties. I think we also have to give Sam or cut him some slack. He's trying to learn a very difficult position. He's trying to play center ice in the National Hockey League, which can be very difficult for a young player. I think for a lot of these young guys, and you know, when I talked to Theo Fleury last year, he echoed this too. They're so used to in junior be just being given the puck, and they know how to play with that puck. And I think Sam, you you alluded to it earlier, but I think Sam still has to learn a little bit how to not play with that puck and how to get that puck back on his stick. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's going to really help round out his game. For sure. If you if you look at projecting what you think Sam Bennett's going to become as a Flames player as he gets older, I really think his upside is being that, as you mentioned, that strong second line center, the guy who's anchoring a, a very dangerous, hopefully second line, you know, in two three years here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really where he has to be to not get lost in the center depth. Well, one one uh, question that I always find myself asking myself when I think about the Flames centers is. Where does Mark Jankowski fit into all this? And if Jankowski continues to develop like he is, we have four former first round picks as centers who are all log jammed trying to get to that. I'm assuming first first. Well, line Bennett can position, also play left wing, which is what I was going to bring up. I think a good option for the Flames going forward would maybe be to put Bennett at left wing. And I know there were a lot of fans who were pushing for Bennett to play center, but with a guy like Jankowski coming. You either got to trade one of these guys or you have to move them around and adapt them to new positions. And I think it's back to your point about learning how to be an NHL player as, a, as opposed to being a junior player. You sometimes have to learn how to move around the lineup and play different positions than maybe you're accustomed to in order to maintain a good position in the NHL. Yeah, no, I could definitely see him being a second. I again, I think he has to he has to be able to maintain a spot in the top six to stick around. For sure, I think yeah. that he's going to require too much money to be a third line left winger center uh, in his next contract. But yeah, I could definitely see him being the second line left winger and maybe Janko eventually being a center. Um, and you know, and I say this every year, but I've never liked the idea of bringing a player right from juniors to the National Hockey League. And I think that Bennett of all the guys on the team right now is really one of them that could have benefited from at least a year in the A. Yeah, I I somewhat agree with you. Um, I mean, there are circumstances for sure where I would want to bring a player straight from juniors to the NHL, like with Connor McDavid, but I don't think Bennett's... Connor, Connor McDavid's David. a very exceptional yeah, case, though. Yeah. Oh, well, even even like a guy like... Um, like a guy like... Uh, who was... Uh, like a guy like Elias Lindholm, 
uh, who jumped right into the Carolina lineup uh, the year after he was drafted, right uh, one position above Monaghan. Because the Carolina offense that year was very, very weak, uh, very thin, and they needed a guy to step in. However, I do agree with you on the point that I don't think the Flames' offense right now is all that weak. And it wasn't when he jumped into the lineup in 2015-16. They just won a playoff round. So I think maybe even the team last year could have even benefited a little bit from sliding a more experienced player into where Bennett was. And also benefit or Bennett could have benefited from this by having an extra year to develop, just like you said. That'd so, be a benefit. Yeah, a benefit. Better fit. Um, no, but uh, but yeah, I do agree with you uh, to an extent that I think Bennett should have waited another year. I think a lot of times when you see those first round guys be slotted right in the lineup, you look at a guy like a Stamkos or a Lindholm. It's generally on bad teams who almost need it as a marketing hype. You know, yeah. look, we just got this guy. Come buy tickets, see this guy. The Flames Seen didn't need Stamkos? to sell tickets. Yeah. yeah. You know, the yeah. Flames, they didn't need to sell tickets on Come See Bennett. And, you know, I know that he had some issues and he was hurt for a little bit. He played one game in his first year. And I just, I, I still think that if we would have put him at the A, it would have eased that transition. And, you know, I'm, some people argue that and say, well, look at Kachuk. And again, I think that even Kachuk, who's doing well now, could benefit from some time in the A. If nothing else, it's a great ego boost. You go down there, if you were top scorer in the OHL, you rip it up in the A, then the team calls you up and says, look, you can do this at the pro rank, show us here. However, I think with sending Kachuk down now, that might be the opposite of what you just said. Uh, I wouldn't I mean, send him down now, but I think at the beginning of the year, if they would have assigned him to the A. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think I, Kachuk yeah. is doing good enough this year on the roster, but... My worry with Kachuk is what happens next year. Is he still good enough to keep that spot on the roster? Yeah, because if you send him down now at the beginning of the next season, that is the opposite of an ego boost because he's exactly. ripped it up this year in uh, in Calgary. But then if you send him right down to Stockton at the be- beginning of next year, what's he going to think? He's going to think, oh, I've I've lost my spot. I've I've done terribly. And so, yeah, now now that he's in the NHL, I think he's in the NHL. He's not a guy like Josh Juras who's going to fluctuate, but, yeah, I, uh, I, I agree that I think Kachuk's been pretty good this year, and there's no point in sending him down now. So looking at those two, Bennett and Kachuk, I mean, we have two highly rated prospects, two guys who the Flames are using as building blocks going forward on this young team. Um, who do you think at this point, looking at them and projecting from what you've seen, has the higher ceiling? Do you think it's Sam Bennett or Matthew Kachuk? I'm going with Bennett, but only because he's a center. And uh, However, I do think that if Bennett is converted to wing in the future, I might it might be more of a toss-up. But I centers are always more equipped to get points. They're always the ones leading the league in scoring. And even from just... The centers are always the stars. I mean, you look at historical trends, all the best teams who have won the Stanley Cup uh, in recent years have been lifted by great centers. And I think on this team, Bennett has more potential than Kachuk because I think also Kachuk, he plays a very physical uh, style of hockey. He might get injured. He might turn into Chris Versteeg. Whereas I think Sam Bennett is tougher. I think he's 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 more in a mold of a guy like Joe Sackick, who, who is a star for a long time on a on a good team who's who drives offense better and who's who has a little bit of a of a toughness to him but who isn't the uh the enforcer or even the even the rough and tumble guy like uh Furland or Kachuk. So yeah, I'm going with Bennett, but I'm not, I'm curious to see what you think. So, so, so if you're comparing him to Joe Sack, does that mean our next GM in about 10 years is Sam Bennett? Goes from <laughs> being the star to being the uh the GM here? T- 10 years. I hope I'd hope in 20 years. I think that when we look at a higher ceiling, it really depends how you define that ceiling. And I left this open so we can both look at, um, you know, however we want to, we can interpret this. I think that Bennett has the better offensive upside of the two. I think, like you said, Kachuk is really going to settle into a role very similar to what his dad was. He was the offensive threat, but he was gritty. He was a hard hitter. Nobody liked to play against him. And I think that's where Kachuk is going to settle, like it or not. I think that's what we need on this team. And I think that's what he's going to have to do in order to stick around. Yeah. I do think though, that Kachuk, maybe not as a flame, but I think that he's going to have a longer NHL career. Um, again, look at his dad. Teams always need players like that. And if you can mm-hmm. be that good middle six, tough 
player, almost like I think what they were projecting Boma to be. I think you're always going to have a job in, in, until you're in your mid thirties because somebody always wants that grit. So I, I think that Bennett, we still haven't seen who Sam Bennett is as an NHLer yet. Yeah. And so I think it's going to be tougher for him to move forward until he figures that out. I think with Kachuk, we already know whether it's what he thinks he's going to be or not. I think we know what he has to do to stay as a flame. And so I think that we may see Kachuk. Let's say I think we might see Kachuk in a Flames jersey for longer because he fills a niche. I think that Bennett in three, four years, we might say we've got three guys who can do this. Which one can we get better trade value for? And I think Bennett might just be moved as a victim of the cap or a victim of, you know, call-ups, that sort of thing. Right. Well, yeah, you look at Bennett and Kachuk, and they're two guys who have entered the Flames at a pretty uh, pretty similar time. Uh, and it brings a lot of parallels for me to the 1991-92 uh, Winnipeg Jets, uh, who had Keith Kachuk and another uh, sort of tougher center who had a little bit of offensive upside in Chris Draper. Um, and But Draper was the center, and Kachuk was the winger. And you looked at Kachuk, and he... Uh, Keith Kachuk, that is, and he went around uh, the NHL for a long time, becoming a pretty good offensive star, but he didn't stay with Winnipeg for his whole career. Uh, and, I mean, neither did Draper, but Draper played the majority of his career for the D Detroit w Red Wings after being traded from Winnipeg to Detroit for $1, but that's a different story. Um, and uh, so you, you look at these guys who were s somewhat in the same mold. I mean, Draper was less offensive than Kachuk for sure, but... Um, and I, th I feel like centers are sometimes more valued by the teams who already have them. Like, a guy like Draper was great at establishing chemistry on the Red Wings for a long time. He formed the grind line for a very long time. Whereas a guy like Kachuk bounced around to four NHL teams, uh, and he was, he was off the Jets by the time he was 30. So, I mean, it's, a, it's an anecdote for sure, but there's some historical precedent for guys coming in at the same time on one team and who, I mean... Yeah, you look at a guy like Bennett, and he's already established himself as pretty much the third-line center on this team who could become a second-line center. But a guy like Kachuk, I mean, I feel like there's more of a logjam with wingers uh, on this team, even though there are a lot of good centers. And now I'm sort of painting myself into a corner. I feel like I might have convinced myself that Kachuk might stay a lot around longer on this team. Huh. You know, I mean, when you were talking about Draper staying with the – with the Red Wings for longer. You have to remember this was a post-cap era. Yeah, and, of course. I mean, part of that, I think, at the time was just that Detroit could outspend Winnipeg. They could outspend yeah. Phoenix back then. They could outspend St. Louis back then. So I think it was easier to keep guys around yeah, in now, a, yeah, or sorry, a pre-cap era. Now that I'm thinking about this a little bit more, I think you might be right. I think Bennett might uh, be outlasted by Kachuk on this team. And I've actually brought this up before in this episode because there's such a log jam at center. And I think that Bennett's, future with the Flames is dictated by who plays better. Is it him or Jankowski? And this pretty much nullifies my last four minutes of arguments. But, but yeah, now I now that I see this a different way, I think Matthew Kachuk will be a Flame for longer. Yeah, I'm not saying that Ben is not going to have a fruitful career. I think he's a good player. I think he's a great young star. I just, I don't know who, I mean, if you try to describe Sam Ben as a player, who is he? And I think he's still coming into figuring that out. And I think he has to do that in the next year or so, maybe year and a half, to really stay here. And I think with guys like, as you mentioned, Jankowski and you know a few other players who might come up from the farm, um, I think that you know he has to really carve an identity as a centerman or a winger to to st you know if we want him to say play his whole career here in Calgary. Yeah, I mean, you look at guys around the NHL like Bennett who. Guys like Corey Perry or Brad, or not like Bennett, but like Kachuk. Guys like Corey Perry or Brad Marchand. And the teams who they play for really value them. They don't trade them for nothing. Whereas guys like Bennett, uh, who are around the NHL, they sometimes bounce around a little bit more. And they, they some one-dimensional players like Bennett, who I, I think Bennett's one-dimensional. I think he's not the greatest in his own zone. But they sometimes have a tendency to fizzle out a bit earlier into their career. So I think for these reasons, and... I know that this is a complete reversal of my argument, which I was going for earlier, but for these reasons, I think that Kachuk might stay around longer with the team, mainly because they value players in that mold more. 
Yeah, Bennett's play reminds me a lot of Jerome McGinley as a flame in that way. He's very one-dimensional. He's not good in his own zone. And I think, you know, if you look at, I think what's really going to be telling for me is Sam Bennett's next contract. Yeah. If this guy gets signed to a four or $5 million deal and he's a third-line center, it's going to be tough to, to convince management, whoever management is going forward, Tre Living or Otherwise. you or me or whoever's the next GM, that, you know what, I need to stay on this team as a third-line center making $5 million. And right. I think that we see it often, as you were mentioning, the overpaid centerman who gets traded to someone who says, oh, maybe they'll do better in my environment. And I think that that contract is really going to dictate Sam Bennett going forward. I, f- I think if he can sign $3 million or less, he's got a, a bright future as a flame, and he can easily earn that contract. I think if we're paying him for... I don't think he'll get into the five range just based on contracts we already have, but if he's somewhere... I mean, if he's getting paid like Brower... You know, I, I think that he needs to really live up to that or he's going to be shipped out earlier. I'm not saying he's going to be traded immediately, but I think in three, four years, as this team starts to become a contender, he could be a good bargaining piece. Yeah, and I think with the way that the Flames cap situation is shaking up, I mean, they've got guys like Versteeg and Backlund who are all uh, coming off the books uh, pretty shortly here. And so I think for that reason, they might go for a bridge deal with Bennett just to get, try and fit all those guys who they like and who are pr- producing pretty well back into the lineup for the future. Um, I, I've said this before, but I think that Chris Versteeg is the second most value, valuable expiring contract coming up for the Flames. I, uh, I, th- I think he brings a lot to this lineup when he's in the lineup. And as for Backlund, well, I mean, we've all seen what he's done in the last few games. So for that reason alone, um, or for those reasons alone, I think that Bennett might take a little bit of a pay cut just to stay for a little shorter term, just to fit those guys in. And I think at that price, we'll be very happy with what he does. And, you know, on my last point on this too, is if you think about the Calgary Flames, and when we think of the Calgary Flames style of hockey, Kachuk fits it better. He's the rough and tumble guy. He's the physical player. I think that, you know, he fits this mold of hockey better. Not to say that Bennett doesn't, but I think that, you know, if you're looking at who do we need to have the the truculence factor, it's going to be Kachuk. You said that word, truculence. And I think sometimes we all forget, as hard as it is to believe, that Brian Burke is the president of this team. And, and yeah, I I think Matthew Kachuk really embodies what Brian Burke is in hockey. He's a rough-and-tumble uh, rat who really gets under other teams' skin. He plays with uh, truculence and belligerence and all of those great attributes, which uh, Burke has alluded to in the past. And So I guess, yeah, for that reason, too, he has a good shot at remaining aflame for a long time. And if for no other reason, I mean, Kachuk is the son of a very prominent NHLer, and I think he will probably get more chances maybe in his career than Bennett will just because of that. Yep, yep, yeah, you're right. You'd mentioned Chris Versteeg. This is a guy that I've mentioned a lot this season. I thought he was a great signing at 950000 when we signed him uh, in the offseason. I think that Versteeg, as a 30-year-old player, is a good uh, pickup for this team. And he's on a one-year deal. And the rule in the NHL is that on Janu- as of January 1st, any player on a one-year deal can start to look for an extension there. Um, he's only played 27 games, but he has 17 points in those 27 Last year, he played 63 games with Carolina and got 33 points and 14 with L.A. What, if you were the GM, uh, would first off, would you try to re-sign Versteeg? Absolutely, 100%. And, and what kind of contract do you think would be fair for Versteeg? I would try my best. Versteeg is, I, b- I believe he's 30 years old uh, this he's year. He's 30? Yep. And uh, I would do my best to get Versteeg to a, a two- or three-year deal with a cap hit maybe at about two and a half to three million dollars a season uh maybe maybe up to three and a half um but i think versteeg is a fantastic passer um this was made evident really early on in the season uh in the second in even in like the second game of the season uh he made a fantastic backhand pass out of nowhere right to yerky yokapaka who was streaking down the slot and he fired home a great goal um he's a great playmaker he i think he's really well liked by his teammates Coming into the season, I wasn't so hot on Versteeg. I thought he might have a poor attitude about playing in Calgary, and I, I, I wasn't a huge fan of him. But as You thought season, it was just anyone's better than Edmonton? Get me out of here, I'll sign with the Flames. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, like, I mean, but as, he, as the years progressed, I've really come to like Chris Versteeg and what he brings to this hockey team. 100% I would re-sign him. Absolutely. 
And a lot of people don't know that Versteeg actually has a modified no trade clause this year. It's a indeed so. Uh, the player submitted a three team no trade list, so he can be traded to any team but three. It's probably Edmonton, I imagine Winnipeg, and who knows what the third one is. Mm-hmm. Um, looking at our our salary cap right now, I mean, you're saying mid twos to three million. If if we were to move Stajan off the books, he's yeah. making three point one two million. Would you give Versteeg Stajan money? Gosh, well, if 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 Las Vegas was to claim uh, Matt Stajan in the expansion draft, I would give Versteeg the exact same contract that Stajan got with maybe a couple of years uh, less uh, on the term. Uh, yeah, three point one two five million a season. I mean, I feel like Versteeg brings a little more to the lineup than Stajan does offensively for sure, uh, and I'm not sure about defensively. I think Stajan The only thing about Stajan is Stajan's healthier than Versteeg. That is true. Stajan is absolutely healthier than Versteeg. And if, and if you looked at a guy like Boma, who arguably would be a comparison in terms of injuries, is making 2.2, mm-hmm. I think that that may be where you end up seeing Versteeg um, you know, signing. I would try to get him under 2. I think you could get him for a couple years under 2 million. And I think I would say, you know what, the I mean if you look at the his NHL stats, he's really never played well, I guess last year he played almost seventy games between two teams, but usually he's kind of playing in the sixty game range. And if we can get him for sixty, I think two million's fine. But if he's playing less than that, I don't think you can pay him three million or two million. You're gonna run into big cap issues there. Well this year, this season, if he plays all of the remaining games, I believe he'll have played I want to say 70 games total. Yeah, that's um, what my math is showing me. Uh, and uh, Roughly. But I think the difference between Versteeg and Boma is that when Boma was signed to his to his contract, I believe, it, yeah, that was signed during the 2014-15 season when he had 15 goals, his big offensive outburst. Boma didn't have that much of a track re- record behind him uh, the way that Versteeg does. I mean, Versteeg is a Stanley Cup winner who's put up 54 points, uh, who's put up... Uh, multiple seasons of 50 plus points I believe he's put up three or two seasons of 50 plus points two seasons of 50 plus uh, 20, 2008, 2009 yeah. and 2011, 2012 yeah. and he's come close in 2009, 2010 with 44 points true and uh, and in 2010, 2011 with 46 points um, in more recent years like last year he had 38 points 34 points, 29 points uh, but those are all in limited games played um, you look at a guy like Versteeg, and I think when he's in the lineup, he brings a lot of consistent offense. But I think it all boils down to whether Brad Living is comfortable with paying him X number of dollars for the 60 games or 65 games a season. And But I think what will push Versteeg over Boma's salary if the Flames do re-sign him is that, yeah, he has that track record. Whereas when Boma was signed to his, uh, <laughs> to his contract, that was really his first big offensive season. So I think just for the name recognition alone, the Stanley Cup, Versteeg will command a little bit more money. Um, I'm not sure what I'm not sure what will happen. I'm excited to see what does happen, but I sure would like to see him back as a flame next season. The biggest reason I was excited about Versteeg was just that we have a guy with a Stanley Cup ring for less than a million. And yeah. I mean on a team that was so close to the cap, that was creative by Trilliving. I think if Versteeg ends up coming back his comparable, not in terms of on ice necessarily, but his role on this team is a more is a more. I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. It's Craig Conroy with the Stanley Cup ring. He becomes mm-hmm. that. He becomes that veteran guy, not necessarily your your first line guy. Though you know Connie could step in there when needed to. He was a good flame. He was a good hockey player. He was a good middle middle lineup guy who you could rely on and do a little bit of everything. And I think that that's what Versteeg as a 30-year-old is going to be looked at going forward is, okay, we're going to bring you in, but you kind of have to be that utility veteran. Yeah, I uh, I agree with that. And um, Versteeg, Versteeg uh, reminds me a little bit of Nigel Dawes, which is a little concerning, but... I still think he has a bit more to him offensively and even a little bit physically. Although, are you saying you think Dawes still has something in the tank? No, I do not think Dawes still has anything in the tank. He did in his season here, and he he did well. But after that, I mean, there wasn't a lot there to to like. But I, I but with a guy like Versteeg, um, I think he I think he's a pretty good leader too as well. And of course, I'm not in the dressing room. I can't see. I can't uh, gauge how how much his teammates like him, but. 
he was on the radio the other day, and, and some of his teammates were on the radio uh, the other day, and they were asked about Versteeg, and they were all very positive about him and what he brings to the lineup, and so was his coach. And I think, But that's think, expected as a 30-year-old veteran with a cup ring. Of course, and so I think that's very important. Uh, that I think he bonds well with his fellow former Blackhawk teammates, and I think he's very important to have on this team. At the same time, the fact that he made it all the way through training camp without a contract, I think, says something about him, too. I think, for me, the whole draw of Chris Versteeg is because he's cheap. Mm-hmm. And I think if we sign him at a $2 million or $3 million deal, he loses some of that appeal of, you know what, he's overperforming. He's getting 900000 I mean, if you look at guys in the team making comparable money, Kachuk's making nine twenty five, Bennett's making nine twenty five, Chason's making eight hundred. Uh, Furlan's making 800. Hathaway's making almost 700. Freddie Hamilton's making 600. Like to me, part of his appeal is he's that veteran who's overperforming for the contract. And I think if we're looking at a team that needs to shed some cap money, I honestly think you could find somebody else next year. Not saying I don't want for Steak back, but I think you could find somebody better at the two, three million dollar level. Well, you look at all the money that's coming off the books for the Flames next year, and you got um, you have Versteeg, who's up at the end of the year, who's a UFA. You have Bennett, who's an RFA. You have Furland, who's an RFA. You have Chase on, who's an RFA. You have Hathaway, who's an RFA. Wybin's a UFA. Englund's a UFA. Watherspoon's an RFA. Yoki Pack is an RFA. Then the two goalies are RF or er, not RFAs, they're UFAs. Uh, Smead comes off the books at the end of the year. So does Bolig and Raymond's buyout. There's a lot of money that's coming off the books there. And so I, with the cap, I don't know if it's projected to go up or not at all. Um, I think I heard somewhere that, that it was, but... Um, it usually does. Yeah, typically does a little bit, but um, I'm not sure with the economy or whatever. I, I, don't, I don't remember it going up too much before this season, but... I, I still think there's a place to fit for Stieg into this lineup after the year. I, mean, I, I definitely think he'll be back. I just don't know that he becomes as attractive at 2 or $3 million. Yeah, and I, I still think for what he brings, he's a pretty good uh, playmaker. He's a great playmaker. He's a great passer. But, but yeah, I mean, if he, if he continues to be made of glass, so to speak, I mean, is there really all that desi- is he really all that desirable? Um, and I if I were the GM, I think, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but I think well. if I were the GM, I would almost say, do it again. You know, I'll give you a million and a half, do it again, show me you can get out there, you can play the majority of the games, then let's talk long term. That's what they did with Josh Juris, and, well, I mean, they just, uh, they didn't they didn't commit to uh, signing him to a uh, to Juris a contract. is a very different case, though. Juris is oh, supposed no. to be a, you know, a fringe AHLer who oh, I think yeah. got lucky. He vastly overperformed, but it's in the same mold of do it again, and... And he couldn't do it again, so he's gone. He's in Arizona. So, yeah, I, 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 I hope he's back, and I hope he continues playing as well as he as he has. That's, yeah, I think that's all pretty much that we can say on Versteeg. But yeah, but yeah, I I like to see him stick around here for a few years. I don't think that he's necessarily. I mean, we th- Matt and I thought he might get penciled in as the first line right winger, and they tried that. And um, I think he's a good guy to to keep around as your you know, middle six right winger. Yeah, yeah. I think he formed some pretty good chemistry with Sean Monaghan mm-hmm. uh, when they were uh, put on a line together. I, f- I think that uh, ever since they've put Monaghan back with uh, Goudreau a couple of games ago, though, um, uh, Versteeg sort of dried up a little bit. I mean, uh, he hasn't he hasn't been producing as much. I, I He got on the score sheet last game, but he hasn't been as noticeable. So, well, But uh, I think that's a good point, too. You know, I mean, Monaghan, I think, can be an offensive powerhouse, and I think that he's playing second fiddle to Goudreau. He's looked at Goudreau's setup man, and I think when Monaghan has his own setup man in Versteeg, we're seeing uh, a very different Sean Monaghan, a guy who could take the setup and put it in the net, and I think yeah. that, you know, we need to be able to do that. We need to have two lines that we can have, I would say, our two, what should be our two best offensive players. Um, you know, with their own setup men. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, like, I'm drawing most of my conclusions here from the Anaheim game since I was there live. And when I was when I was there, the, the Monaghan and Versteeg were two of the guys who didn't show up at all, I didn't think, that game. And it's been some of the same for the last week. I mean, Versteeg had a big game against Colorado, got a goal and an assist, but, and he got an assist against Arizona, but... He w- he was a minus player against Anaheim and Vancouver as much as plus minus is derided and I I mean he's he seems to be somewhat inconsistent I I think we said that about a few players on this show but 
I, I still see in this player a pretty good playmaker who I think should be around. And I, I see what your point is in that. But again, to it, me, at 950000 it's okay if he's yeah. inconsistent. Yeah, at at $2.3 million half, or three, yeah. he's got to be on every night. Of course. And and so, yeah, you got to find that fit like they have with Backlund and for a leak. And right now, I thought they had a good fit with Monaghan. But, ever, I mean, Gulletson must not have seen it that way since Goudreau's back with Monaghan and... I mean, if you look at the breakdown of money on the Fords here, Goudreau and Monaghan are each making, Goudreau's making almost seven, Monaghan's making 6.3, Troy Brower's making 4.5 million, Froelich's making 4.3 million, Backlund's making 3.5, and Stage's making 3.1. So I don't think that you want to put Versteeg in that top money earning echelon on this team yet. No, I, I think, I think on that, in those top six guys in terms of money, I think two of them are overpaid in Brower and Stajan. And I think if Versteeg gets any more than three, I think he'll join that. And I think even if he gets three, he might join that. Um, I could I could accept three million for one year, but I really don't want this to be okay, we got rid of Stajan to yeah. take on another bad contract. And I mean you gotta look at the UFA crop that's coming up. I mean, there's guys who are pretty uh pretty um appealing who are going to be uh, free agents after this season do you want to replace and I, this going back to your earlier point is is there going to be a more attractive guy than Versteeg like a guy like maybe Alexander Radulov although he might command a bit too much money uh, if but, I sorry go ahead uh, no go ahead no you yeah um, I was just going to say if I was Trilliving I think what I would do is I would try to get Versteeg signed for under two if I can, I put pen to ink and get it done. If I can't, I say, you know what? Let's go to July 1st. Let's see what we can do. Maybe somebody's willing to pay you more. Maybe they're not. And, you know, we'll talk then. And I think he might end up in a Chris Russell-type scenario where he's asking for more than teams want to pay for him, and he has to drop his price to get a deal. And that could be with Calgary or with somebody else. Now, I hope that doesn't result in what happened with Curtis Glencross. But uh, that, that, that was really too bad. But... But, um, I, yeah, I, I think Versteeg has a lot of future in the NHL, and uh, whether it be with the Flames or somebody else, I think he'll be a consistent 40-point player, uh, if he, even if he plays 60 or 70 games. But, yeah, whether, uh, whether he re-signs with the Flames or not, I guess only time will tell. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd like to see it happen for sure. I think he can bring some good chemistry and leadership. And you were mentioning one of Versteeg's uh, line mates this season, which is Sean Monahan, who mm-hmm. is wearing the A for the Flames this year. And this is a guy who we're expecting big things from. We had two kids to sign. We had him and Goudreau to sign. Um, Monty got a big long-term deal. He's 22. He's making $6.3 million. And he's struggling. I mean, if you look at his numbers this year, he's not putting up the numbers that we're expecting him to from a player with that much money. He's not putting up the numbers that we would hope. I mean, last year he put up 63 points in 81 games. Now he has 20 points in 40 games. So, Mike, why do you why do you think that Bennett or that sorry that Monahan's struggling, and what do you think we do about it? Well, with Monahan, I mean. When you see him back checking and when you see him for checking and when you see him without the puck, he doesn't seem all that invested in the play. And that's not something that I like to see from a guy like Sean Monahan, who's a former first round pick who's been fairly one dimensional in his first few years with the Flames, pretty offensive but not fantastic in his own zone. Um, and I mean he's currently clocking in at just over a half a point per game. Uh, I know how many people hate plus minus, but he's second only to TJ Brody in the poor category uh, in plus minus and the worst on the team uh, with minus 14. Uh, I mean, he hasn't been like Sam Benton taking an exorbitant amount of penalties, but I mean, the goal scoring just isn't there for Monahan this season. He'll, he'll get, at this rate, he'll get 20, which he hasn't, he hasn't, gotten just 20 since his rookie season uh, when he only got 32 points. So, yeah, there's something wrong here. Uh, and even then people thought he was underperforming. Yeah, I mean, like, Monaghan had a te- good 10-game point streak roll in there uh, um, in uh, early December. And ever since it's ended, he hasn't scored. Uh, he hasn't scored a single point since the end of that streak in five games. Uh, he's been a minus player in three of those games. He has yet to be a plus player since the end of the streak. Um, I, I, I mean, Glenn Gullison tried to put him back with Mon- or back with Johnny Gaudreau uh, in the Arizona game to maybe try and spark his offensive output, but 
it didn't work. Uh, it was all pretty much the backland line and the power play and Dennis Weidman scoring in that game. Um, I don't know what what really needs to happen with Monahan at this point. I mean, he's he's playing a lot every night. Uh, over the past few games, he's been averaging pretty much 18 minutes a game, which is prime offensive scoring uh, time for a guy like him. So it just isn't going in right now for for Monahan and uh, and his shooting percentage this year has been a bit lower than previous seasons, 12.5 percent, but. It's not terribly low. Uh, I mean, when you consider his his previous seasons, he he seemed to be getting more shots off. This year, he's on pace for one of the lowest shooting seasons of his career. So I just think he needs to become more invested in the game because I I haven't been seeing him involved in the play as much this season as I have in years past. Yeah, to me, I think I think Monahan is a victim of a coaching system change. I think that he is a guy who's still, as a 22-year-old, still adapting to a new system. I think he's not sure what his role is on this team, if he's supposed to be a setup man or a scorer. And I hate to go back to sort of the old Jerome McGinley conundrum, but I think we have to find a player to play with Aginla. Or with uh, Monaghan, sorry. Just like we had to find a center for Aginla all the time. And I think that... I think we're going to do better as a team if Monaghan and Goudreau are ultimately broken up on two different lines. But I think that... I think Goudreau can almost have anyone on his line to set him up, and he's good. I think Monaghan needs the right setup guy, and I think what the Flames have to find right now is who that guy is. Yeah, I sure miss the 2014-15 season because we never really had to worry about that because the first line was just pretty much always clicking ever since it was assembled, and I believe it was November or December of that year. I mean, it was Goudreau, Monaghan, and Yuri Hoodler who had a fantastic season. And I, the Flames right now just don't have a guy who's clicking. They've tried to put Alex Chase on with those two guys, and I mean he's been. Fine, but even if he clicks, Chase on's not a first line right winger. Yeah, for for sure. And I mean he never really has been. And I, I mean a guy like Hoodler was a middle six guy before he came to the Flames with Detroit. But I, the Flames, whether it be to, they, whether it be to, I've got a guy to play with both Goudreau and Monahan, or just a guy to play with Monahan. They need to find somebody who can really click with him because I think Goudreau is going to be fine with whoever he plays with, but Monaghan is a little bit tougher. And he he was working with Christopher Stieg earlier in the season, and that line's been split up. So I'm curious to see what the coaching staff will go with. I think that's where they expected Brower to be. They expected Brower to be the next um, Yuri Hoodler in that respect, and it hasn't turned out so far. I'm wondering if maybe going forward with uh, Brower out of lineup, you see them break up the Kachuk, um, Backlund, Froelich line, and I'm wondering if you might see a line that has um, Kachuk, Monaghan, Versteeg try those guys out. Hmm. Well, I was thinking, uh, personally, I was thinking uh, maybe a line of Goudreau, Monaghan, and Froelich. But, uh, but then I but then I We've seen that line be- before, though. I mean, after... After Hoodler got moved, Froelich got moved to that first line. I didn't think they had great chemistry. Well, then, okay. But then how about then you try Goudreau, Backlund, Froelich? I, uh, I think that might be a pretty uh, pretty cool line. Uh, maybe pretty dimensional on both 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 ends of the ice. Uh, um, uh, I mean, you, you got guys like Backlund and Froelich who are pretty good offensively as well as defensively. And I think a guy like Johnny could really complement them really well. And... Uh, but I'm not the coach. He he really knows his players best, and if he thinks Alex Jason is the best fit to go alongside those two guys for the time being, well then so be it. And like Matt said in the last podcast, there's four really good right wingers in the top ten of the draft this year. So even if the Flames falter and they can't find that chemistry with Goudreau and Monahan, well maybe they'll land one of them. Yeah, I think this might be a role that we have to bring in uh, an established veteran for. I don't know if it's going to be necessarily the next guy in the draft. I'm just running the, the lines here on paper. Mm-hmm. Tell me what you think of this while Brower's out. So we have a Frolik monahan versteeg line. Okay, sure. Um, that would give you Goudreau, Bennett, and either Furlan or Chase on. Pick the one you want to put in there. Uh, I'll go with Furlan. So if you go with Furlan there, we don't break up Kachuk and Backlund. So we'd have Kachuk, Backlund, Chase on. Okay, yeah. yeah. And oh, then, yeah. yeah, sure. And then Boma, Stage, and Hathaway. Yeah, yeah, that line works. It has worked. Yep, I and, and I think the nice thing about that is you insulate Monaghan. You've got Versteeg and Froelich, who are both good playmakers. Mm-hmm. And in that case, somebody should be able to make the play to Monaghan and put it in the net. 
it'd be nice to see Versteeg move back to Monahan's left side or right side or whatever side. Um, yeah, I, I, I really like that I that, that lineup. I think it would have a lot of depth and a lot of uh, talent spread throughout it. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in seeing that line for a game for sure. And, you know, I mean, look at any player, any any top player. You look at a Crosby, you look at a Malkin, you look at a, you know, name any top player you want. They all have off years. And Monahan's 22. It's not like this is going to mean that he's not going to live up to this contract or he's not as good as he was. I think it's an off year. It's a new coach. There's some adjustment. I think that Monaghan gets back in the wagon, and I think if he's going to have an off year, this is the year to do it because I really don't think this is the year the Flames need you know, a top Sean Monaghan. I think he's got a year or two. I've said I still think this team's a year or two out of real contention. Mm-hmm. And I think that if Monaghan can adjust his game, whatever he's got to do this year, whether it's mentally or on ice or they need to find him someone to play with, this is a good time for him to go through that. I'd rather he go through that now and be ready next year and the year after than struggling when we really need him. Well, for the record, I think that Sean Monaghan will have a resurgence uh, this month and after a- after the new year. I, I think uh, I just think he'll come into his own as the year progresses, and I I still think the Flames will make the playoffs for sure. Uh, I don't I, mean, I, I don't doubt that they might make the playoffs, but I don't think. And Matt and I have talked about this. I don't think you can legitimately say there's a cup contending team. For sure, for sure, no. Uh, I think the best case scenario for the Flames is they'll win maybe one or two rounds. I I, I still think they could win two rounds, but uh, but I don't think they'll go any further than that. Uh, it, that's the best best case scenario. Worst case scenario, they fi- they finish ninth. That's that's for me. Yeah, no, and I, and I still think they might make the playoffs, but I just I think there's a big difference with a team like Calgary making the playoffs in a weak Pacific division and a team like Calgary being a legitimate Stanley cup contender. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Calgary, Calgary. I don't think there's any chance that the flames will win the Stanley cup this year, unless something absolutely insane happens. And, uh, I, they're just not ready yet. And, uh, they have so many guys who are still developing into the, the players who they will become. And, and like the, the lineup right now, I believe like they're so young that I don't think they'll have much endurance once the playoffs comes around. I don't think they'll, you're right. They aren't a, they aren't a contender for sure. I think best case they win one or two rounds. Well, let's hope that you're right and that Monahan does come around because I think that as soon as Sean Monahan, you know, gets his scoring touch back, maybe he needs to break a finger or something too because that seemed <laughs> to do it for Goudreau. Put on those crazy um, uh, gloves that Goudreau is wearing. Maybe that they're they're happen. hanging around the locker room. Someone might as well use them. Yeah, uh, the Ninja Turtles gloves. Yeah. But, you know, when he gets that scoring touch, I think that we're going to see the Flames, uh, you know, goals for go way up because now we got two guys who should be contributing great offense instead of one and the rest of the team. Absolutely. Well, I think uh, Dougie Hamilton could be included in that too. He's having a fantastic season. Yeah, it's yeah. you're right. But I, I don't think you look at generally your number three defenseman as one of your top scorers on the team. Is Dougie Hamilton the number three defenseman of this team right now? I would beg to differ. Who do you think would be your top three? I think uh, the number one defenseman on this team right now is Dougie Hamilton. Uh, I guess if you look at it on ice, yes. If you look at it salary cap-wise? No, it's Jordan. I, right? I think that the only reason Brody's struggling is he's having to carry on Weidman. Yeah, well, that's true, and also because of his off-ice issues, obviously. But uh, but and, if you if you the, put Brody yeah. and Geo back together, then, you know, who's your number three? <sighs> who's Sorry? If you put Brody and Geo back together, you've who's only got one there? obvious number three. Of course, it's Dougie Hamilton, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. But in the positions, in the positions that they're all playing right now, I think Dougie Hamilton is this team's number one defenseman. For sure. I, again, this year, yes, but I think looking at a long-term depth chart, Hamilton right now is number three. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you could say that for sure. Um, let's move on to something a little bit different. Something that happened before you were even born, Mike. This was oh, no. the <laughs> this is the Doug Gilmore trade, and this happened 25 years ago today, on the second of January. This was a monumental trade for the Flames. Uh, Doug Gilmore, one of the the best Flames of the time. He was a great player. He was part of the the Flames offense at the time. Uh, arguably, probably the best player as part of the 1989 Stanley Cup team. And big news: Calgarians woke up to find he'd been traded to the Toronto Maple Leafs. And this, I think, might have been one of the biggest deals in terms of players moved. Um, at that point, there was a 10-player deal. It still is saw... the largest deal in NHL history. Is it? Players. Yep. Okay. 
So going to Toronto was a 28-year-old Doug Gilmore, a 29-year-old Rick Natras, who is a big-bodied right-shot defender and part of that 89 Stanley Cup team. Jamie McCowan, who is a eh, not a top defender, but a, a respectable left-shot Natr- defender. Natras' defense partner. That's right, yeah. Uh, Rick Wamsley, Calgary's backup goalie, and again part of that team. He backed up Vernie. And Ken Manderville, a two-time World Junior gold medalist and one of Calgary's top prospects. And you'd think for a package like that, the Flames would get some fantastic player back. Wayne Gretzky's coming to town or something. Mm-hmm. What did the Flames get back? Well, they got Gary Lehman, who was two years removed from a 50-goal season. Alex Godnuck, a fringe NHLer who had 49 total games at the NHL level. Michael Petit, a 27-year-old depth defenseman. Craig Barube, uh, we know him as uh, best known for his pugilism and his fighting. And Jeff Reese, a 25-year-old backup goaltender. So I think, you know, they always say you can't judge a trade until 10, 20 years later. I think now looking at this at the time and looking at it 20 years later, you have the same reaction. The Flames got hosed. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you look at a guy like Barube, and he was the most impactful Flame from this deal. He played two different stints with the Flames. And, I mean, when you're trading guys like Gilmore and McCown and Natras and Wamsley uh, – for and the guy who you get back who plays the most for your team is Craig Berube. I mean, you got a problem, <laughs> and uh, to say the least. And I mean, even the other guys who they got back, Gary Lehman. I mean, he was useless in his time with the Flames. I mean, he got the last laugh as he went on to win the Stanley Cup with Montreal in 1993. Uh, but and I mean, the most notable player from this deal for for the Flames is Jeff Reese, and for one reason only. Uh, because he holds an NHL record. Uh, he uh, is the goaltender with the most assists in one game uh, with three. And he did that in February, I think, of 1992 or 93 in a 13-1 Flames victory over the Well, San everyone gets a point in a game like that. Yeah, but he got three points as the goalie. The, the beer guy probably got a point. Huh? The beer guy probably got a yeah. point. yeah. Yeah. See, and I, you know, and I mean, I, I was not old enough at the time to remember a lot of what was going on here. But um, Gilmore walked out on the team, and Doug Rise, Rise Brow, the Flames GM, and his old mentor Cliff Fletcher, who was uh, Toronto's head honcho at the time, made a quick deal. And if you look at the next time something similar happened, which was when Joe Newendike uh, held out on this team, they trade him to. Uh, Dallas for Corey Millen and this this kid. What was the name? Uh, Drew McGinley. That's yeah. right. Although that's and, not who they wanted. Uh, they wanted uh, was it uh, Todd Harvey or? But, yeah, uh, they made a better choice there. Yeah. And yeah, you know, sure. I mean, even if you look at the star they got rid of after that, arguably the Theo Fleury deal, um, got a bunch of crap. But they got this one kid with two broken legs. Um, oh, what Robin, was his name? Yeah, Robin Robin Regeer. That's right. I thought I thought it was Robin Big Ear. No. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I don't even I don't even remember, but that was very similar. We just got a bunch of crap um, for Flurry and Regeer. And at the time, Regeer was a throw-in. Um, he was he had two broken legs from a snowboarding accident. No one ever expected him to play. But I guess the Flames were allowed to pick one of five prospects, and it was either Regeer or Tange. And they yeah. ended up getting them both in the end, anyways. So yeah. Well, and then you look at when they finally ended up trading Regeer, they got a. Uh... Who was it? They did they get Alish Kodalik and uh, and uh, oh we're not going to talk about that. One other one other guy uh, was it was it Paul Byron? Oh yeah, he's ripping it up this year. So, so I'm uh, I'm just looking at the uh, the full flurry deal. So it's Theron Flurry and Chris Dingman oh, to wow. Colorado for Wade Belak, Renee Corbet, a draft pick that got us Jared Stoll, which was useless because we didn't sign him and he went back in the draft, and then Robin Regeer's future considerations. So <laughs> this team hasn't had a good history of trading away our stars and if you look at trading away jerome again you could argue return not great on that one either trading away bo to return not great on that one either so i don't know there's something about calgary that we just we can't make a good deal for our stars no for sure no i mean and you and i talked about this before we went on the air one you probably remember with uh, toronto absolutely. in your in your lifetime was when the flames got rid of at the time their hot prospect young defenseman won dion Phaneuf off to Toronto. And this was, I think this was the first trade. I really believe this was the downfall of Daryl Sutter was this move. This was fans started to question before this. It was like the, the arena should be named the Sutter saddle dome. And, you know, instead of singing the national anthem, we should pledge our allegiance, Daryl Sutter at every game. And I think this was really 
Whereas a GM, at least, people started to go, eh, maybe this isn't the right guy. But he traded Dion Phaneuf, Freddie Schustrom, and prospect Keith Ollie to Toronto. And people were most pissed about Ollie um, because he looked like he was going to be a good defensive prospect. And now he's a walk-on with the Stockton Heat. And in exchange, they got Nick Hagman, Matt Stajan, Jamal Myers, and Ian White. So, you know, really, if you look at that, the only player of any value, and we're still trying to get rid of him on this crappy contract, is Stajan. Well, I mean... I uh, I insist that the Flames won this trade, and uh, and uh, some people really probably rightfully question me for this, but I mean asset wise, I mean they still have Stajan, and uh, I think the best thing that Stajan will ever do for the Flames, other than his goal against Vancouver in Game Seven, uh, or was no Game Six in 2015, but uh, but um, the best thing that Stajan I think might ever do for the Flames is to be selected in the expansion draft. But that's it. I mean, so if you if you look at it that way, though, I mean, again, they traded away a, a star for a bunch of junk. I th- and I think that staging, you just want to get rid of I mean, if we could trade him, great, but nobody wants the contract. So you're looking at the expansion draft as a cheap dump. However, I think that the Flames traded Dion Phaneuf right before he turned bad. And I think Fan- fans in Toronto really hated Phaneuf by the time that he was traded to Ottawa. I think we got right under right out of that predicament. The, as soon as we could have, and we just got what we could for him. Because Phaneuf was the captain of the Leafs, but he didn't really do much in Toronto, uh, aside from lead them to the playoffs once. And uh, and so I think just because of that overtime goal in games, Game 6 in 2015, and, uh, and, and I mean, Stajan's Stage, been a pretty reliable contributor uh, over the course of his long tenure with the Flames. I mean, I remember when they first pulled off that deal, and I really hated it, and... To an extent, I still sh- scratch my head at some points, but I mean, Stajan, Stajan, I really wanted the Flames to get rid of him as soon as they got him, but he's turned into a pretty good veteran, I think, for this team. He's a good veteran, but he's not a $3.2 million veteran. Absolutely not, but uh, I think if they were paying 1.5 for him, we'd be a lot happier. And well, as a fourth-line center, that's you're lucky to get 1.5. Mm, yeah, yeah, I mean... And we it, that this uh, this was on us. The Stajan contract was on us. It was signed by the Flames. But yep. Um, I mean, you look at other trades that the Flames have made in recent years, like the Tangay trade, uh, for, uh, with Corey Sarge for Shane O'Brien and David Jones, and uh, that's a pretty awful trade. And compared to the Fanuf trade, that's a. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm happy with what the Flames yeah, but I'd say that. that that wasn't of the same magnitude. I mean, if Absolutely you're looking not, at that Sarich or Tangay being our star, you're fooling yourself. Well, Alex Tangay did uh, was was, I mean, uh, Dion Phaneuf when he was traded was probably one of the two or three best players on the Flames. Alex Tangay when he was traded was the second best player on the Flames. Yeah, but Alex Tangay is like prestige. He was made of glass. True, but he did have 66 points uh, the season before he was traded. Yeah. No, I don't know. It's just it's it's interesting to recap that deal and look back at it and go, yeah, it's still junk. And I really hope that, you know, the next time it comes to the Flames moving a big name, be that, you know, if they ever move Giordano or Brody or even as we talked about a Bennett or a Kachuk, I hope that we're not looking back 25 years from now being like, wow, they got hosed again. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And no, no one else other from that deal really ended up panning out. I remember one thing about Freddie Schustrom, and it was one Spinorama goal that he scored with the Flames. Uh, and Hagman I think he went to Phoenix for a couple of years and then just, just faded out. Yeah, I mean, Hagman was useless. I hated Nick Hagman when he was with the Flames. And Jamal Mayers scored one goal, I think. It was against Ottawa, and he did nothing. And Ian White, I mean, I remember a lot of Leafs fans were devastated by losing White, but then... He didn't do anything here, so that didn't really matter either. So I think you got to look at it as enough for Stajan. And w- would you rather be paying Dion enough seven point five million dollars now or Matt Stajan three? Well, we would have been out of that deal by now, I think. What the Fanuf? The Fanuf deal. I'd have to look back. Well, he's still being paid seven point five. But did Toronto re-sign that? I have to look back. But no, you're right. You're right in that case. I guess I agree that they should have. They should have gotten rid of Phaneuf, but I just think that they probably could have found another deal. Mm -hmm. And I think if we look at that, there were even GMs at the time who said, I didn't know the Phaneuf was available, and I would have paid more for him. And I think that that's the same same issue in both the Gilmore deal and the Phaneuf deal is they seem to pull the trigger too early. And I'm not saying that I still want Dion on this team, but I think that 
in both cases, the Flames, they would have waited a little bit and talked to more GMs, could have figured something out. Um, Brian Burke was the mastermind in Toronto of the FNUF deal. But I think that they could have got better deals in both cases, and I think that was the big downside there. Well, when FNUF was uh, was traded by the Flames, he was on a contract that he signed with the Flames for 6.5 a season, for six seasons. And then with Toronto, before the start of the 2014-15 season, they signed him to a ridiculous seven-year, $49 million contract. So pretty similar contracts, but we'd still be paying him about $7 million either way. So would you rather be paying him that money or Matt Stage in half that money? Right. I, I think, honestly, I would have... I don't think that we would have kept FNUF around until 2014, 2015, but I think even if you kept him a year or two and you would have moved him out at the same time you moved to Ginla and Bo Meester and guys like that, I think that there would have been better return. Mm-hmm. Well, but you look at the return that the Flames got when they moved out of Ginla and Bo Meester and they got guys like Poirier and Klimchuk and... Kenny Agostino and Ben Hanowski, and are those really the guys who you wanted to acquire for those guys, right? I mean, maybe if enough wouldn't. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but of I course. just think that there's better return for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the other more of the stories, don't trade with Toronto. Yes, absolutely not. Never do that again. Never, ever. And ever. I'm, I'm just looking here at Treliving's trade history as Flames GM, and uh, he has not made a trade with Toronto, which is good. So I think that... Anytime we make a trade with Toronto, a big trade, it seems like we get hosed there. So we want to make sure we're not doing that. And I honestly expected more trades with Toronto because of Berkey. But Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't make any trades with Toronto when he was uh, the Flames GM. And the last time we traded with Toronto was acquiring Joel Colborn for a conditional fourth. So we got the better of that one. But that doesn't right previous wrongs. Although it would have been nicer if the Flames could have gotten something for Colborn. But oh well, yeah. But you know what? As a fourth-round pick, to use him and let him go, I'm not too concerned if it costs a fourth for acquisition. And he's done absolutely nothing with Colorado this year, so nope. other than his hat trick and opening night. So, uh, Mike, we our fans haven't heard from you. Matt and I have talked a lot about it, and you alluded to it previously. But the expansion draft is coming up this June. The Las Vegas, or the sorry, the Vegas Golden Knights will be the 31st team, and we know that the Flames are probably going to lose a player in that draft. Um, What's your prediction for who the Flames lose either in the draft or via UFA signing before the draft? Well, uh, before the season, I saw a lot of people online predicting that uh, the Flames would lose Yerky Yokopaka in the expansion draft. And, you know, that won't happen. Uh, He doesn't look like he's worth taking anymore. Sorry? He doesn't look worth taking anymore. No, I I mean, he's been fine this year as a number five or number six defenseman, but he's not going to be the most attractive guy for the Vegas team. Um, a guy like a Lance Boma, I don't think will be the guy because I, I just don't think he brings enough offensively for the for the for the Vegas team. I mean, he might be given a bigger role in Vegas, but I think you can also find a lot of other free agents or guys in the draft who could fill a Boma role for cheaper. So anyway, at the end of the at the end of the day, I think it'll it'll either be um, they'll uh, they'll tr- they'll uh, pick uh, Michael Furland or they'll uh, sign Derek Angland. Uh, that's that's what I think, and uh, I think Furland is a pretty good. Uh, you know, might get you point three five points per game, and uh, he'll um, he'll be very physical for a for a new Las Vegas team, and uh, then you got a guy like Engeland who's a pretty steady veteran presence on the back end, and uh, I think either of those guys would be pretty good picks for a Vegas team. England's also a Vegas native, and a lot of people forget that as he lives in Vegas, I believe, in the off season, so it makes sense for him to go home. He used to play for the. Uh, for he the played Las for the Las Wranglers. Vegas Wranglers, the CHL. Mm-hmm. When Glenn Galton was the coach. Yep, I I think that, and you know, I mean, I've stated my opinion in the past, but I think you may see either England or Stajan picked up just because the Vegas team's going to have to get to a a salary floor in their first year. I think you're going to see them take on some bad contracts to get there and then let those guys go after the first year. Right, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the price your guys for sure, yeah, when they have to reach that cap floor. But um, yeah, I mean, guys like like Furland, uh, he's he's on a contract right now, I believe it's uh, 900. Yeah, Yeah, he's very uh, reasonable. Um, and a guy like England right now is on a 2.9, although that's he that's expiring at the end of the year. Both of them are. Um, so, I mean, yeah, th- there is a chance that they could take a guy like Stajan simply because of his bigger contract. 
<laughs> I know uh, Matt last week was exploring the possibility of maybe the Flames exposing Brower. <laughs> yep. I don't see that happening, to be honest. Um, I, I, I think Brower, uh, management values Brower too much to expose him, and I think they can get something better for him in trade um, than simply exposing him. But I guess if they went down that road, they'd probably claim him. But... And uh, what were your thoughts last week? Uh, I think it was last week that I mentioned my uh, my prediction that we may see the Las Vegas team commit some um, uh, some shady business, if you will, by essentially saying to a guy like, um, let's say, Derek England, that, hey, we're going to sign you, but not till January 1st, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, take stage in and then sign... Uh, Sign England on July first, and essentially, I mean, the Flames don't care; they've lost England anyways. But it's it's a little bit of tampering if they do that. Yeah, I think the NHL might look into that if that if they get any, any reports of that happening. Uh, but but um, they got a veteran GM in Vegas; he knows how to get around it. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, yeah that that would be open to some interpretation, I'm sure, by the league's head office. But um, yeah, uh, I I I. I only think the Flames will lose one guy at most. I hope I hope they do. I, I like the depth on this team, but if so, I just I think that right now, no matter who they lose, you're going to be okay. I think that there's not, you know, some teams are worried because they've got a big goaltender like a flurry or a big player they might lose. I think no matter who you lose, the Flames will be okay. I, I'd be mildly sad if they lost Yoko Paka, but just for name value alone. Uh, so yeah, at that at that rate, yeah, there's nobody uh, who. I think would damage this hockey team terribly if they lost him. Yoki Pack has really become a six seven defenseman. You pull Shillington up and everyone will forget about him. Yeah, for sure. I mean I think Yoki Pack is twenty five but well he is twenty five, but I I think he has some potential to develop into a five defenseman for this team, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't hold my breath on that. I think he's pretty replaceable ultimately, but he'll be back next year, I think, as an RFA, so I don't want you as Flames GM if you're signing guys based on their names. Oh, We're going to have no, a terrible no, no, team no. that's... No, I, I wasn't saying that. I, I think he's shown some... I, he's been pretty good defensively, I think, this season. Uh, with some, with the occasional... I think he's not a great puck handler. Uh, he he has a tendency to let the puck just roll off his stick, and he's, he's not a fantastic passer, but I, he's a good enough skater, and I think he might have a future with this team, but it depends on how other guys in the organization do. And I mean, if you if you do look at the expansion draft, and if we get out of there losing Furland or Yoki Paka or England or Stajan, I think of you know of all the teams in the league, you can still say the Flames did pretty well. You breathe a sigh of relief if that happens. I mean, the Flames right now have a really deep forward core. I mean, I I think that, and I I think it'd be a shame if they lost a guy like a Versteeg or a or a or a Kachuk, but they're not going to lose Kachuk because he's too young, but. Of like a guy like a Versteeg or a Froelich or a Backlund because they're they're really valuable guys and I I really got a lot for living for not giving out a ton of no movement clauses because I feel like in this situation that would really uh, oh yeah if this I mean if this uh, expansion draft five years ago we would have been screwed oh god because yeah like they had like I remember there was one point where like they had had like eleven no movement clauses on the team and like it was like oh god how how are we supposed to deal with uh, moving players around. Well, that's it. Of the 23 players, I think at one point half of them had no moves, and that's yeah. why it took a while to, to get you know any traction Yeah, because we had to wait for a lot of those contracts just run out. Rene Bork and Curtis Glencross, and those aren't guys who you want to have no moves. I mean, maybe no. no. Trades, yeah. Curious. Well, I think that's about all the Flames news for the week. Anything else you want to talk about? No, I think that's about it, uh, Dan. So let's look ahead to the next week. Uh, it's our first prediction set of the new year. And yeah. if we if we look back at how we did the week between uh, December 20, 22nd and now, the Flames had eight points on the table, four games, and they did better than matter, I thought. Uh, we got six points, so three wins of the four games. I thought we'd split them and we'd get four winning against the Avalanche and the Coyotes. And Matt was a little more Very pessimistic. Wrong. Very and well. he thought, well, they usually do the opposite of what he says. So he had two points, and he thought they'd just win against the Ducks. So at this point, finally, this season, I'm ahead. I'm up 4-1 uh, to one against Matt <laughs> in the okay. predictions episode. So, Mike, you're going to be pinch hitting this week and picking for Matt. All right. Well, um, So we've got three games on the docket this week. If we take a look on the 4th of January, the Calgary Flames are in the Dome playing Colorado again. 
And then Friday, Saturday, we have back-to-backs, back-to-back home series. Uh, Friday, we're in Vancouver, and Saturday night, the Vancouver Canucks come to Calgary. And these are going to be good games to see. So if you want to go see either one of them, I mean, if the last Colorado game was any indication, we'll probably light them up. Uh, go check out our friends at Tick Ticks and buy yourself a pair of tickets. So, Mike, you're my guest. Why don't you pick first? Six points on the table. How do you think we're going to do? Well, okay. Um, at home against Colorado, because... Fun fact, the Flames don't leave Canada at all during the month of January. Um, so, yeah, they're at home against Colorado, and uh, I think they'll win that one for sure. Um, I think they'll take it by a score of 5-1. to one. Anyway. 5-1, um, to one, wow. Yeah, I th- yeah, and, a, and the only goal will be a Ginla from Bork and Como. Um, and you don't then, think uh, Colborne will get in on that one? Sorry? You think it'll be Como as opposed to Colborne? No, yeah, I think, well, yeah, Colborne doesn't score any points these days. I mean, yeah, it's got to be Blake Como. With that emotional showing that he had in the last game, getting uh, was he ejected for that? I can't remember, but I'm not sure. But um, anyway, and then the home and home against Vancouver. Okay. Uh, well, I was talking to you beforehand, and I thought I thought they'd sweep uh sweep the Vancouver home and home. Now I'm not so sure. So I'm gonna say that they're gonna win uh the uh the game in Vancouver, <clears throat> but then they're gonna lose the the second game in Vancouver in overtime. The second game against Vancouver is the one in, in Calgary. You think they'll lose in overtime? I think they'll lose in overtime. I think they'll go 2 0 oh, 1. So you think we're going to get five points this week? Yeah. Interesting. And why do you think an overtime loss? Um, well, you know, yeah, the Flames don't lose a lot in overtime, do they? Well, um, I actually I think it'll be a shootout loss. Uh, shootout loss. Yeah, shootout loss. So it doesn't count in the row column for Vancouver. But, um,. <clears throat> yeah, I just think uh, the Flames over the years have been inconsistent in shootouts, and they don't have Joe Colborne anymore, so there you go. Well, I'm going to do slight similar to yours, but I'm going to go two points. I think that the Flames are going to uh, beat the Avalanche, and I think it, home and homes are always weird. Um, but with Vancouver, we've had some epic battles with Vancouver in the past, so I think that we're going to win Colorado, and I think we'll beat the Canucks at home. Hmm. Any points in the loss? I don't think so. I I think it's going to be a close game, but I don't think they'll get any points in that one. I think that Vancouver tends to play hard against Calgary in their own barn. And, you know, it's it's always a tough place for us to go. Not as tough as, say, the Pond in Anaheim, but... Mm -hmm. Vancouver's arena is a tough place for us to go and play. And, I mean, we've got wins out of there, but generally we've got to work hard for them. And I think that Vancouver might surprise us in their own barn. And I think coming back to Calgary, we're going to do well in our barn. Yeah, if I remember correctly, uh, during the 2014-15 season uh, in the playoff series against Vancouver, the uh, the Flames only won one game at, at uh, Rogers Center, and it was game one. And I just have to bring this player up because he scored the winning goal in that game. And everybody knows that uh, David Jones scored the winning goal in that game. Oh, and now I'm done. So for those that don't know, Mike is a bit of a David Jones fanboy. He's, he's the one. I don't know why. It's it's sort of weird. Uh, that's why I brought up the Colorado trade earlier. Uh, yeah, it's it's just – he. I thought he was an underrated player when he was here. I don't know. But, uh, but uh, he, he never seemed to get any love from the fans. I never saw his jersey around anywhere, so – Good on him. Well, well, I think people didn't know what number to get. If they should get 18 or 54. 19 or 54. Matt Stajan wears 18. That's right, 19. Uh, that was that whole, you can't wear a number higher than, what was it? Um, you can't uh, wear a number higher 30. than 30, so he well, had to I pick think, another number. I think, um, I think the problem there was that, uh, like, he, 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 well, actually, I think because he was in Colorado before he came to the Flames, and uh, he wore 54 in Colorado, and I think he wanted to wear 19. But Sackick was there. And then he gets to Calgary in 2013-14, uh, and he wants to wear 19. But the other Jones is here, the Blair Jones, and he's wearing 19. So I think once those guys all get out of the out of the, out of of the the system, well, there's 19 for you. Just take it. What number did he wear in Minnesota after he got rid of him? He wore 12. I don't know why. Maybe he wanted to be Jerome Ginley. And, you know. I don't know. Different locker room. Who knows? But, you know, David Jones is out of work as far as hockey goes right now. So. Yeah, too bad. He, uh, he had a PTO in Anaheim, and he wore 30-something there or whatever. But but you're yeah. on a PTO. You don't pick. No, no. And he he wasn't very impactful. So, yeah. so well, hopefully he'll find a job somewhere. Yeah, too bad. I, he, I thought he was a good Canadian boy, but, yeah, never mind. 
Well, Mike, it's been fun having you on. Thanks for joining me on the show this week. Yeah, it's been a real honor. Uh, Anywhere you want people to find you or, you know, read what you're doing online. Do you have a well, Twitter uh, account or anything you want to promote? Yeah, sure. Um, I uh, I don't post as much on Twitter as I used to, but you can file me. Uh, fi- file me. You can find me on Twitter at following CGY. Uh, I guess, uh, I guess my, maybe a New Year's resolution will be to restart up that blog that I used to used to have uh, so following the flames and uh oh, i i need to get a domain name for this but it's following the flames dot com flame but um you can also find me at the fireside chat uh doing doing game recaps and maybe in the new year i'll do the occasional editorial and that sort of stuff doing the odd article here and there and um i mean uh i'm on various forums online you can uh, find me with different online names i'm sure some of you already know uh and that's pretty much it i'm glad to be here thank you thanks for joining me and uh hopefully we will talk to you again soon yeah it'll be, yeah, it'll be great have a good week you too all right this has been another fireside chat don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca follow us on facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat and to follow us on twitter at fireside podcast catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com fireside chat is licensed under a creative commons attribution non-commercial share alike license hosted by dan stevenson and matt dubor produced and edited by peter marino and ryan Coetz.